Sorry, we had a little bit of a hardware problem there, not software, to be clear. <laughs> so. I'm Jim Whitehurst, I'm President and CEO of Red Hat. And in that role, I have the opportunity to sit on the front lines of some extraordinary things that are happening in technology. But I think what's much more interesting is the implications those innovations in technology are having on how we live and how we're going to work going forward. Our grandchildren's lives will look radically different than ours. And I'm not talking about the Jetsons, I'm talking about our society and our institutions. Let me explain. The last major transition in our economy was the Industrial Revolution. And with it came the greatest increase in wealth creation that we've ever seen in history. In fact, if you think of what is the industrialized world, between 1 AD and 1750, there was almost no change in GDP per capita. Right? The output of people changed almost not at all in over 1,700 years. And then around 1750, with the growth of the initial factories, uh, textile factories in England, over the next about 120 years, we saw a doubling of output. So GDP per capita doubled in a little over 100 years. That, at the time, was the largest output or increase in human wealth that we had ever seen. And while that's impressive, and certainly more than we had seen in the prior 120 years, if you really thought about what someone's life looked like in 1870, it wasn't a whole lot different than their grandparents or their great-grandparents. 90% of the population still worked in or around agriculture. The average manufacturing facility had three and a half employees. But then something really fascinating happened around 1870. We hit an inflection point. And over the next 30 years, over the next 30 years, GDP per capita doubled. And over the subsequent 30, it doubled again. And over the subsequent 30, it doubled again. Every 30 years since 1870, we have doubled our output per person in the industrialized world. So what happened around 1870? What, what was so special? I would actually argue that there were three interrelated but seemingly incremental advances in technology that occurred that created a platform on which we saw an explosion broadly of innovation. Let me spend a minute reviewing those. First off, standardization. Around 1810 in England, a gentleman, Henry Maudsley, developed something called the auto lathe. Now, the auto lathe is basically a device that allows you to make the same part over and over and over again. Before the auto lathe, one nut went with one bolt. Any part you want was handcrafted, machined uh, by a single craftsman. So if a nut broke on a machine, you had to have somebody make a new nut and a bolt. With the auto lathe, for the first time, we had standardized piece parts, which meant to make complex machinery, people in disparate places didn't even have to know about each other or how they were making things. Second, around 1870, we saw significant advances in engine technology. Up until the late 1800s, the Industrial Revolution was powered by water or wind power or by external combustion engines, often thought of as steam engines. Then around 1870, we saw major advances in what we call the internal combustion engine, which we often think of as the standard engines of today. That all of a sudden allowed for a level of portability and a, a level of economy with power, which for the first time allowed us in, in mass to replace animal or human power uh, with machine power. And finally, we reached a tipping point with our transportation system. Now, railroads have been around for a long time, but in the late 1800s, we finally got to the point where the majority of the population could be accessed or could access a common transportation system via the railroads. When these three things came together to create a platform for commerce, we saw a veritable, a veritable Cambrian explosion of innovation. Basically, the concept of mass production was born. For the first time, you could amass large amounts of capital, you could 
use standardized piece parts and leverage what we think of as the economies of scale to make goods and then get those to markets, uh, to the majority of the world's markets in a common transportation system. The doubling of wealth that we have seen every 30 years since 1870 is a direct result of the concept of economies of scale. I would argue economies of scale, i.e., you make more units in, uh, in a standardized way, the cost per unit goes down. Economies of scale has been the single largest driver of wealth creation in our history. Right? That is what's led to the development of the economy in the way it has. It's also changed almost every institution around us. Right? The modern corporation was born. We went from factories having three and a half employees to the U.S. Steels, to the Fords, the General Motors, the iconic companies uh, that we think of, of, of today. It changed not only business, it changed almost every aspect of our society. Migration to cities. As the need for workers and the higher wages uh, for workers at factories emerged, we also got urbanization. We went from 90% of the population living on farms to a very small min minority living there, and all of the benefits and the issues associated with urbanization all emerged in the early 20th century. Modern capital markets were born, and that's not just relevant to bankers, right? It for the first time allowed the average person to save and invest and ultimately be able to retire and live on their own. And any of you who do not want your parents living with you, you should appreciate the fact that capital markets actually do exist. This is how people are allowed, uh, able to live in Florida and not with their children. <laughs> Finally, also in the early 1900s, the Industrial Revolution, or I should say the implications of the Industrial Revolution, dominated political discourse. Right? We had a whole new economy that was based on up applying mass capital and massive amounts of labor to leverage these economies of scale. Well, how's that wealth going to be divided? Right? This dominated political discourse, and we got vastly different solutions around the world, from revolutions in communism in Eastern Europe, uh, to socialist systems in other places, to a, call it a more paternalistic capitalist system uh, that we have in the United States. Labor unions uh, born, uh, the social safety nets that were developed, all of this happened in the first half of the 20th century, directly related to the Industrial Revolution. I would argue that someone born in 1950s life looked radically different than someone born in 1870. And now I'm, about, I'm going to argue that we're about to go through that again. We're about to go through something as profound as the Industrial Revolution. And to make it easy, I'm going to call it the Information Revolution. What I find fascinating is the parallels with the Industrial Revolution are uncanny. First off, the Industrial Revolution, as I said, started around 1750, but really hit an inflection point around 1870 when a set of technologies came together to create a platform for innovation. We see the same thing in, in technology, right? Computers and computing have been around since 1950, right? We've had payroll processing and IT departments that have been around for a long, long time. But we finally reached the point where three interrelated and very key technologies are coming together to create a platform on which we'll see a mass of, in of innovation. And the parallels are, again, uncanny. First off, our transportation system, the internet and broadband mobility. We can now get very, very rich, high bandwidth content from anywhere to uh, anywhere using the IP network, the internet, and, and uh, mobile broadband. Second, our engine technology, the microprocessor. Moore's law continues to march forward and march forward and march forward. Microprocessors double in capacity and in performance every two years. Microprocessors are the engines of information, allow us to manipulate, uh, store, and communicate information at dramatically faster speeds than ever before. And finally, and very importantly, and probably the newest of these innovations, cloud computing. Cloud computing is a myriad set of technologies which aren't necessarily relevant to the traditional business person, but su suffice it to say, they come together to componentize, to standardize, to modularize computing. So you can buy computing by the drink. They're the equivalent of the auto lathe, right? We, we're now able to make standard nuts and bolts, right? Standard compute, standard network, standard storage that you can buy, uh, dial up uh, and get on demand. 
And when those three things come together, we've created a new platform on which you will see an explosion of innovation. So if the Industrial Revolution was about how we make things more cheaply, how we leverage economies of scale to make per unit to make things more cheaply, the Information Revolution is about how we use things more efficiently. Right? It's no longer about being able to, to make things and getting marginal increases uh, or decreases in, in the cost uh, of a specific good. It's how do we use the goods we have more uh, efficiently. And I know that sounds subtle, but it's, uh, but it's actually quite profound, right? We've hit a tipping point because we've always known if we used assets more efficiently, that was good, right? So Walmart cross-docking or UPS and FedEx around logistics were ways to better leverage uh, the assets that they own. But we're reaching a point where information and the cost of information have dropped so much that literally the information can rip apart from the underlying assets and literally become the means of production. And this is important because economists would estimate that the majority of our activity is waste, or in economic terms, transaction costs. And those transaction costs, defined broadly, are extraordinary from the average car is driven one hour a day. So all of this production and stuff to make a car, average car is driven one hour a day. How often do you get lost or you get stuck in traffic because the lights aren't working right or because the road system has not been uh, optimized uh, for those traffic patterns? All around us is waste. We see it all around us. And I will argue over the next 100 years, unlocking this new wave of wealth creation for society is going to be about how we better use assets. It's no longer going to be about using economies of scale for how we better make assets. And when the very nature of value creation goes from economies of scale uh, to uh, efficiency and effectiveness in how we use assets, how value will be created by companies will also change. Right? We're going to go from an asset-based means of production to an information-based means of production. And very specifically, how businesses are able to differentially and better create and leverage information is what will define competitive advantage and therefore how they create value. Think of simply Apple, and I know it's a trite example, uh, and it's often talked about because, because of their design and engineering prowess. I would actually argue as much of Apple's success is the fact that it can orchestrate a global supply chain to make products at lower cost than its competitors without uh, manufacturing anything. The reason Apple is the most valuable co uh, corporation in the world is a combination of an engineering and design prowess which allows it to charge a price premium and a sub global supply chain management prowess which allows it to uh, build products at lower cost. The second major factor in value creation for companies is how labor is used. Right? In the Industrial Revolution, to simplify, most jobs were formed around rote, rote, task, rote tasks. Right? In this next generation, rote tasks will be automated. If it can be specified, it will be automated with robotics, IT, 3D printing. Right? New jobs will be created, will require initiative, they'll be, require creativity. And for businesses to create value, it's going to be about how those businesses can leverage and better get creativity, initiative, critical reasoning out of their people. And so here's the rub. Traditional enterprises, the way we think of them today, traditional ways that we organize people, uh, are not designed for a world where creativity, where initiative, where drive, uh, are the key ways that we'll create value, right? The traditional hierarchical management systems were developed in the Industrial Revolution for the Industrial Revolution, for marshalling thousands of workers working together um, but doing relatively rote tasks, right? The corporation was hyper-optimized for this task, right? The, the traditional corporation amassed capital, that's no longer required, and marshal thousands of resources doing the same thing, no longer required. We're now seeing networks emerge, and networks uh, are going to be a competitor for how we organize human activity going forward. And we see it today uh, in myriad ways. Uh, Silicon Valley is a great example of a network hyper-efficient at creating startups. Open source software uh, unraveling the human genome. 
networks will be a competitor to corporations, and the role of the corporation is the central vehicle for how we organize human behavior will change. Now, I don't know how it all plays out. I'm not saying corporations will go away, but I can say their relative central role will go down over time. And so that has myriad implications for us. Let me just hit a couple. First off, if lifetime employment is no longer the norm, then tying our social safety nets like pensions and health care on uh, uh, your employment status at a corporation is crazy, and that needs to change. Uh, that's something we need to proactively manage. Second, in the same way the beginning of the 19th or the, the beginning of the 20th century political discourse was all about how dollars were going to be or wealth was going to be split between capital owners and labor. Remember the robber barons of the early 20th century? Now it's the one percenters, right? No longer is value creation associated with capital or labor. It's going to be smart individuals. And how we ultimately decide to split that wealth among our society will be a key driver of our political discourse over the next 50 years. Finally, and most importantly, education is the new oil. Education will determine the wealth of societies. And we all need to invest. We need to invest heavily. And not only do we need to invest, we also need to transform education because it's no longer about facts. It's no longer about teaching people to do rote tasks, right? It is about teaching people to have critical reasoning skills, to be able to take tons of information and synthesize it, and synthesize it better than, uh, than others. That will be the ultimate driver of wealth creation for nations. To summarize, the information revolution is going to be as impactful as the industrial revolution. Your grandchildren's lives will look nothing like your lives. This is major uh, implications for business, for play, for everything about how we live. We'll have new institutions built in new ways. It's going to be fun, it's going to be exciting, it's going to be challenging. Uh, but for all of us, managing those transitions uh, will be key to uh, best optimizing the outcome for us and our children. Thank you.